and welcome everyone to our webinar for today's discussion. So welcome to Forum Kajian Pembangunan. And today we will discuss about the uh, the growth agenda and financing green project and environmental DIC approach. So our speaker will be Busekar Utami Setiasuti. And before Busekar uh, start the, uh, her presentation, I will introduce Busekar first. So our speaker is Busekar Utami Setiasuti. Uh, she graduated from the PhD program in economics from North Carolina State University on July 2018. And uh, now she is a uh, assistant professor or lecturer at the Department of Economics, Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, she teaches in undergraduate level and also in the graduate level. And she has research interests on open, my, open economic macroeconomics, fiscal policy in small open economy DIC model, monetary fiscal policy interaction in the emerging economy, and also environmental DIC model. She has published articles, so her recent articles uh, is about the external debt management as macro potential policy in small open economy, published uh, on the economic analysis and policy. So, uh, as you, as all of you, uh, might know, I have, Bulidia have uh, Bulidia has also explained to you that you can ask the question through the Q and A or raising hands, and also uh, for those for for all of you that are joining uh, via YouTube, you can uh, also ask the question in in the comment box. So, Busakar, uh, you may start your presentation right now. All right. Uh, thanks, Saudi. Thank, thanks, Malidia. So I'm just going to start my presentation by saying hi, everyone. I hope you're all healthy. I hope you're all safe. I know that this COVID situation is getting uh, it's crazier and crazier by day. You might heard that your friends are sick, you might, your families are sick, but hopefully everything is going to get better very soon. So first of all, I would like to thank FKP to recording in progress me, uh, to this session. I wasn't sure whether this was the right forum for me to talk about my research <laughs> because most of my research are macroeconomics and you know very little related to development. Um, as introduced by Masfaudi before, my research interest is actually more into. Um, monetary policy, macroprudential policy, and fiscal policy in a macroeconomics context. Uh, but I just, you know, uh, recently wrote a paper about a green economy, especially looking at how we can uh, boost green production through green financing. Uh, before I start, I think I'll share the uh, share my screen. So you can see that this is my slide. This is my presentation. Um, I talked to Bolivia before. If somehow it got frozen, I have to stop my video, but fingers crossed. All right. So let's, I hope you guys can all see my screen. Um, this was something that, well, if, 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 if I take an analogy of a musician, um, they, this is my indie project. <laughs> so my, my, my pop music project is, you know, a lot of macro prudential monetary policy uh, modeling, but I'm really interested in um, environmental economics topics as well, especially because I'm an avid traveler. I have a ridiculously embarrassing uh, amount of love for traveling, <laughs> especially when it comes to traveling in the nature. You know, I like to go hiking, trekking, you know, um, diving, just like the flyer. Thank you so much, Malidia. You captured my you know, my my deepest passion for the ocean <laughs> perfectly. I'm like, that's we I have something in common. I was like, I didn't tell this to Malidia. Like, how could you oh. read my mind? <laughs> but anyways. Um, it was started from, yeah, so the, the, the love that I have for, for, for the nature and that I love to be in the nature and, you know, now that I uh, live part-time in Bali and Jogja and 
and I get to travel to places and, you know, I, I love snorkeling. The, the thing that I, you know, want to do probably if I can do it every day, I would do it every day. <laughs> um, one time I was so disappointed that my favorite spot, the snorkeling spot in uh, Tama National Komodo was completely ruined. And it was not even like, you know, three years after it was like two years. This to, to see the, the, the level of disruption and such a, a short amount of time that was very devastating like literally every spot that i went to it was not the same as it was two years ago and then that, that's when i started to learn about oh yeah the the earth is warming the uh, ocean is getting warmer and the corals doesn't like that right when you saw a coral that looks like oh very bright pink and green and blue floret flor, fluorescent you think that, oh my God, that's so beautiful. It's not. It's literally their last defense mechanism to stay alive. <laughs> so they're basically dying. But I can go on and on. I can geek out about this. I should have been marine, a marine biologist instead of economist. <laughs> okay, that's it. But I'm just going to stop. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to stop there. So when my two friends at Bank Indonesia, Mbak Arita Risanti and Mas Adi Perwanto asked me, would you want to do research in, you know, green economy, something that we can do together? Um, I'll say I would be very happy. So this is when the paper was kind of like uh, took shape. So this paper, please don't quote, don't cite. This is a work. This is a work in progress. So we're still trying to develop the model. Um, this is the paper that I wrote last year when I were when I had my tenure at the bank at Bank Indonesia as a research partner. So I'm writing this paper with Mbak Santi and Mas Adi. Um, before I start the presentation, as usual, the facts and opinions in this paper are solely our personal statements and do not reflect the official views of Bank Indonesia and its board of governor. So the usual disclaimer uh, applies. Now, why do we care about this at all? Um, when you look at the the, the earth, the, the 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 environment surrounds you, you might not realize that you know we have created so much destruction. Well, we're very lucky that we live in Indonesia. We don't really feel the effect of climate change. We don't see wildfires. We don't see extreme drought. We don't see extreme flooding. Uh, we we do have flooding when it's rainy season, but it's not like massive flooding or we don't uh, experience hurricane or tornado or something like that. But if you go to a uh, country with four season, you know, if you go to U.S., I lived in the U.S. for six years. Those are the things that you're constantly, you worry about. When you live in California and you'll be like, are we going to get wildfire again this year? Most probably you will. The, the question is, is it going to be bigger than last year? Probably it will. Probably if you look at also in India, where you have like this massive, massive, massive heat wave, where people basically, when you live inside a house, at night, it feels like you're being inside an oven because during the day, the concrete on top of you absorb all of the, the, the heat from the sun. So it's very difficult for you to sleep at night because um the the the, the climate is is so you know it's it's so extreme right the temperature is so extreme um and that's kind of like problematic if you look at the how climate change affect the economy not just individual but also how the climate change affect the economy in a sense that now there are more risks being introduced. Say, for example, you have transition risk. Suppose that the government implement this policies to make sure that people are transitioning to green production, let's say, or green technology or green investment. Um, you will have that reevaluation of carbon intensive assets. And that would you know, create a shock to the financial system and, and, and et cetera. Um, the more straightforward risk is physical risk. 
you know, you have damages that being caused by those climate change related events. Now you have communities that being ruined by tornadoes. You have communities that ruined by, you know, extreme drought. You have communities, you have, you know, uh, massive, massive uh, areas with a lot of housings that's ruined by wildfires. Right? And, you, and if that's happening a lot, then that's going to be problematic for the uh, government. If you look at the central bank where they have um, a task, where they have goals to stabilize the prices, being in an environment where you have a lot of climate-related events, it's also very hard because the transmission channels of monetary policy, um, even, you know, you have interest rate channel, you have credit channel, you have expectation channel. That's, that's when, you know, you have like expectation about the future inflation, let's say. Well, you have a lot of climate-related events that would kind of like gear up people expectations towards the inflation, right? No matter what the central bank do, when people think that, oh, the climate change would ruin the environment so much, we're not going to have like good harvest this year, food prices are going to go up, inflation is going to go up in the future, nothing the central bank can do. So monetary policy transmission channel is it's, it's going to be affected uh, for sure. If you look at the evaluation of carbon intensive asset, um, you know, lately we're thinking of like, okay, what if we, you know, shift to green investment, let's say, you know, you're using machinery, you're using engines that run by biodiesel, let's say, or solar uh, uh, electricity from the solar panel, let's say, what about those carbon intensive assets that you have had in your uh, plant in your in your production. What are you going to do about it? Uh, if the if the prices of those assets are falling and those assets are being used as a collateral, then that would be kind of like destabilizing in a sense for the whole financial system itself. So there's a lot of things that we don't think of, like we might haven't thought about. Uh, you thought that oh there's no relationship between climate change and monetary policy. Like central bank doesn't, you know, they, they, they don't, they're, they're not concerned at all. They do have a lot of concern about this because they're directly affecting how monetary policy affects the uh, economy. And if you look at the trend lately where a lot of countries are, you know, starting to put measures to limit the pollution, limit the, you know, dirty production and things like that. You have the carbon tax, you have cap and trade policy, you have a lot of different things to just basically limit the, um, the emission from dirty production. But how do you tell people to shift to green production? Let's say, oh, you shouldn't pollute the economy. Sorry, you shouldn't pollute the environment. Sorry. Uh, by using fossil fuel anymore, you should shift to biodiesel. You think that those machineries that that runs on fossil fuel can be easily uh, uh, transferred into something that using biodiesel. I don't. That, that's that's something's very hard to do. Uh, especially also not just the technology shift, but also the price of green energy itself. So I told you before I. Um, bought a house in Bali and then uh, we installed a solar panel, just two panels. The panels are not expensive, but the inverter <laughs> is crazy expensive. So if we want to be, you know, using green energy sources, it's extremely expensive. It's, it's very expensive, let alone if you have a plant. If, think about it, if you have this, you know, massive plant where you have a lot of uh, uh, need for electricity, you bought your electricity from PLN, let's say, you know, the PLN generates the electricity from coal. And then you want to change to green energy resources, uh, sources as a solar panel, that would be very costly. So the uh, uh, the, the cost of investment to, to shift to, to, to the greener 
energy sources. It's it's not cheap. Um, and if you look at the rate of return, and if you look at the uh, investment compared to the fossil fuel project, sometimes it's not worth it. Sometimes it's just not worthy, you know, a going solar panel or biodiesel or, you know, other greener uh, energy sources. So you have lower rate of return, but on the other hand, also higher um, risk on investment. And if you look at these green producer, most of them, not just green producer, but also, you know, uh, all businesses, they have a very high dependency on external financing. And difficulties in accessing those external financing is one of the main obstacles of green producer. Um, sometimes you're, you're kind of like, okay, this is a green technology. So this is very new as opposed to when you look at like a, a more established technology. Um, and then the bank would be kind of like reluctant to, you know, just give money, uh, extend the loan to the green producers. Well, that's that. What if also there is a effect from monetary policy to the green producer? So not only mon monetary policy affected by the climate change, but it's the other way around. So monetary policy has a, an effect on the climate change by affecting the green producer. So think of when inflation is really high, then the monetary policy needs monetary policy authority, the, the central bank needs to increase the interest rate, the cost of investment would be increasing as well. And we're seeing that probably there's a gap in there that we can fail in terms of like providing subsidy for the green financing. Um, so that's what we do. So we're looking at how monetary policy affects the green production and see whether we can uh, introduce a policies that would mitigate the negative effect of monetary policy to the green production. When we look at the literature, we have uh, seen a lot of various environmental DSG uh, paper, but most of them are talking about how, for example, you can use carbon tax to limit the emissions or you, you, know, you can use cap and trade and things like that. Um, nothing is on the the effect of monetary policy to green production and what kind of policies can be implemented to limit those negative uh, effects. And we saw that a lot of these papers are actually calibrated rather than estimated. So that's what we do. Well, if you ask me, why do you go down this route? Why do you have to model uh, 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 the problem using DSG model. Well, there are basically just no data for green financing in Indonesia. Uh, when you look at, well, first of all, when we started this paper, Mas Adi was still working at the macro provincial department in, in Bank Indonesia. And we talked about it and um, I was like, do we have that data? Do we have the data for green financing? If, if, if you have the uh, data from banks, do you know where do they lend the money? Or do we know whether they lend the money to, you know, green producer as opposed to non-green producer? And we don't have that. Uh, we do have a policy on green loan to value ratio for automobile and uh, houses, but that's still not implemented yet. So they put it on hold. So the bank, so, so Bank Indonesia put it on hold. So that's not even um, happening yet. Does that stop us from, you know, conducting the research? I don't think so. <laughs> so we're stubborn like that. What we do is we're gonna build a macro model that resembles Indonesian economy. I will tell you what, when I say resemble, it's not like, you know, this model has like two, 260 million people. <laughs> it's not like that. Um, 
But we built a model that's simple enough, but it's pretty insightful in the sense that it can give us some ideas of, you know, if we implement this policy, whether we have a, uh, a massive improvement in, in the sense that the green production, boosting green production and reducing emission. Okay. So we evaluate the effects of monetary policy and fiscal policy on green production and emission. And then we, you know, play around, we simulate some um, policies to know whether the effects of that policy is big enough to reverse the negative effects of monetary and fiscal policy. All right, so I'm not going to go really crazy in explaining the model because probably this is something too technical and I don't have a lot of time. Um, but Lydia, I think you should, you know, let me know if I have like 20 minutes left or 10 minutes left or maybe my spoiler can do that. Um, but I'm just going to go through like really quickly to the model and what we do, sorry, what we did and what we will do. So I told you before, this is something that's still uh, in development. So this is not the, the, the finished product yet, but I think we can give already a some, uh, sorry, some insightful, some insightful ideas. So the main feature is a closed economy environmental dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. So this is not quite like the computational general equilibrium model. If you have some uh, speakers talk about it before, I'll let you know what's the difference. Uh, and then in this model, we have two type of goods. We have green and dirty goods. And then we have two policies relating to the environmental aspect, which is carbon tax and green financing um, subsidy. The model is estimated to the Indonesian economy. We're using quarterly data from 2010 to 2019. If you ask me why 2019, because 2020 uh, was when pandemic started and we didn't really want to uh, use the, the abnormal period, so-called, the abnormal abnormal period of the uh, pandemic. So we stop at uh, Q4 2019. All right, so um, if you see, if you're seeing a lot of math here, <laughs> you don't need to be anxious or anything like that. As I said before, you know, these are all just a story. I'm a macroeconomist, I tell my story using math. So this is not a formula at all. So if you're looking at this equation right here, this just tells you that the consumption good that I'm consuming. So for example, this bottle of juice, this is being produced using green goods and using dirty goods. Say for example, the inside, which is the juice that's organic. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's good, but the plastic itself, it's not, right? So, so that's the idea. You have a finished uh, uh, consumer products, but that consumer product comprises of green goods and non-green goods or dirty goods. Uh, of course, when you look at the price of this finished product, which has green uh, components and non-green or dirty components, the, the price, the aggregate price would also be comprises of those two. So price of green goods and price of uh, non-green goods. This is, how look, uh, this is how our household looks like. There uh this is basically their behavior um their rational agents they maximize expected lifetime discounted utility that's what that is subject to a budget constraint they they do have a constraint so the household deposit money to the bank and then the bank would lend out the money to the producer uh be a green producer and dirty producer now the banks look like this. So on the left-hand side, that's just the loan to the green firms and non-green firms on the right-hand side, that's just their net worth and the deposit. Uh, if you look at here, the if you look at the uh, 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 net worth is, you know, it's basically just the interest margin. So that's the deposit. That, uh, so that's the, sorry, the interest rate from loan minus the interest rate from deposit. That's, that's how the banks are making money. I'm not going to go really, you know, deep into this because yeah, I, I don't think there's any value to this at all. But um, I think I'm going to go to the fir uh, firms because that's more important. Um, the final 
products is com- so I said before comprises of the green products and uh, non green products. The interesting is that now you have two type of producer. You have the dirty producer and you have the green producer. The non green producer, the the dirty producer, when they uh, well, they produce goods using capital and labor and technology. Uh, SK is the, uh, uh, call it? It's the quality of the capital itself. When they produce, they gonna pollute. Uh, so these firms, the dirty firms, they are producing emission from the production. So we have a uh, an equation for emission that is you know, uh, a function of production. So the higher the production, the higher the emission. If you have a higher emission, then the stock of atmospheric carbon would go up. In the sense that when you have a stock of atmospheric carbon going up, that's like, you know, climate change is getting, getting worse, okay? Now the firms can abate the emission, so we have M, that's the level of uh, emission abated by the firms. And that abatement, you know, incur a cost. So there's what we call a abatement cost. That's, again, a function of how much the emission being abated by the firm. Okay. Um, this is this ger- just their profit function because they internalize that um fact that they are producing emission when they're pro- when they're producing goods so now you have that abatement cost and also they're being taxed for every emission that they produce they're going to get taxed by the government again so they're internalizing that uh, emission tax into that profit now the green intermediate goods firm doesn't have that problem so they don't emit pollution. They're basically carbon neutral producer. Um, when they rent capital to invest, so the, uh, what call it, the green investment is subsidized by the government. So now you have that uh, rental rate of capital uh, for green firms, for green investment is being um, subsidized by the government. The monetary policy looks you know, very standard Taylor rule. So the interest rate, the interest rate, I'm sorry, um, respond to inflation and output. And the fiscal policy is very simple as well. You look at on the left-hand side, there's just the government spending. Uh, on the right-hand side, that's the uh, government um, you know, tax income. So you have the lump sum tax, plus you have the carbon tax. On the left-hand side, the government spend for consumption, and then the government also do subsidy for the green firms. Now, what do we do? Um, We build that model and we estimate the model. So we're using Indonesian data from quarter one, 2010 to quarter four, 2019. We have real GDP per capita, CPI, short run interest rate, and credit per capita. Uh, we seasonally adjust all of the data and then we uh, extract out the trend from the data using Hodrick Prescott filter. What we do um, is to basically try to estimate the parameters that we're using in the data uh, in the model. So, for example, beta is stochastic discount factor. If you're familiar with macroeconomic model, that just shows how impatient the household are. Uh, So the lower the betas means that the household is impatient. So they value current consumption a lot more um, than in the future. Alphas, for example, that's just the capital intensity. Delta is the uh, depreciation rate. We calibrated those. We calibrated the mean and we calibrated the distribution. So we have a prior belief on what those parameters are. And then we're going to use the data, Indonesian data, to uh, get what the mean and how the distribution looks like. It's a, it's, it's a very neat idea of you, you cannot um, 
model 200 million of Indonesian people, but that your model could actually um, mimic what Indonesian data is, right? So we're taking that. Um, so so we're taking that analysis into you know, what we call the Bayesian realm. <laughs> it's basically just Bayesian analysis, just Bayesian estimation. So we have the data. So we have the real data of Indonesian data, and we have the data from uh, the model. So what we call simulated data, and we ask the computer. Uh, we ask MATLAB. <laughs> Okay, given our prior about this parameters, what parameters, the value of parameters that would, um, that the Indonesian data agrees on, right? So then the computer uh, spits out all of these numbers. Right? So th this is what we call posterior distribution. Um, and the idea is that now you want to generate the simulated data that is similar to the real data. Um, this is the prior and posterior distribution. The gray one is the prior distribution. This is our guess. This is our prior belief about what, what, what the parameter parameters look like. And then the black one is the posterior that agrees with the Indonesian data. Okay, so that's so, so that's what we um, so that's what we did. In Bayesian analysis, this is, this is very different than your um, classical statistic uh, regression, for example, where, where you assume that the parameters are fixed, the data is random. In Bayesian analysis, you, you uh, believe, well, the data is fixed, but the parameters are random. The randomness of the parameter is shown by the distribution of, it, uh, of the uh, parameter itself. For example, now you have, uh, for example, right here you have the you have the uh, delta. For example, um, delta could be anything inside this distribution. It's not something that's fixed, like zero point zero five, let's say, um, but it could be anything inside distribution. So that's the difference between Bayesian analysis and the uh, classical analysis. Now, uh, if you look at the historical data and the values, or the data that you generated, uh, simulated from the model, uh, we get a pretty tight fit. To, this shows that our estimation is actually quite good. Now, what do we do after that? After we got all of the parameters and then we look at the impulse response function, as we call it. We look at the effect of some shocks, different type of shocks to the economy. Say, for example, what happened if you have non-green technology shocks? Um, you know, technology for dirty production is increasing. Okay. Well, GDP is going to go up, consumption is going to go up, investment is going to go up. But because that technology is dirty technology, the level of emission is going to go up as well by a lot. And that would exacerbate the climate change because now you have more stock of uh, atmospheric carbon. What if you have a shock on green technology? Now you have a you know um, advancement in green technology that's happening in that economy. You saw that the GDP is not going up by much, uh, probably because you have only small amount of green producer in that economy, so it doesn't it doesn't have uh, kind of like learning by doing spillover from one producer to the next producer effect. Uh, so it's isolated inside that uh, green uh, producer. Emission goes up, but by just by a little, because there's also a complementarity between green uh, products and dirty products. Uh, if you look at the stock of atmospheric carbon, with the same amount of increase of technology, you won't have as much as if the shock is on the dirty production. Now we're going to be looking at how monetary policy affects the green production. That's the one on the left-hand side, um, bottom left-hand side. When we have an increase in interest rate, so contraction in monetary policy, of course the investment goes down. That's like you know the cost of investment going up, and demand for investment is going down. That's also happening in the green production. So you see that when the interest rate goes up, a green production is going to uh, fall. Now, we don't like that, right? We don't like 
to have monetary policy limiting the growth of green production. So what can we do? Uh, we did some simulation for two policies. So we add carbon tax in the model. We also add green financing, which uh, has never been modeled in the literature. So we haven't seen anyone doing that. And then we examine whether implementing those policies could do much about that contraction in the green production. So on the left-hand side, that's the emission tax. On the right-hand side, uh, bottom, uh, top and bottom, that's the green financing subsidy. When you look at the contractions that being caused by monetary policy, um, carbon tax does more than green financing subsidy. And this is this is very shocking to us because we hope that this green financing uh, subsidy mechanism that we put into the model would do something, you know, really marvelous. <laughs> it could, um, now that the green production would be not contracting anymore, it could be, but it's it's not happening. So we're like, okay, what's going on? Um, probably because it's it's related to the monetary policy and how that affects interest rate directly. What if we look at fiscal policy? Um, as you know, the fiscal policy, they uh, they also, if you look at the government spending, at, at least the wasteful one, um, those are affecting the economy via the uh, interest rate as well, right? Because, you know, government spending crowds out private investment and private uh, consumption. But there's not like direct uh, effect on interest rate as you know when you saw monetary policy. Then we're like, okay, probably this would be having more significant economically significant effect on the green production. And then we saw that the green financing subsidy did very little, even when we compare it to the carbon um, tax. So what's happening here? We're pretty confused, like we're um, trying to make sense of things. And I think we came up with a, 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 a very good sense of how little financing uh, subsidy, I'm sorry, subsidi subsidizing green financing would, would, would um, cause in this economy. Simply because when you decided that you want to go green, if you want to undertake a green investment, suppose that you want to replace all of your um, machinery to be using, you know, uh, biodiesel, let's say the cost of replacement is so big that um, you don't really care about that 2% difference of on the bank loan. It's, it's not, it's not significant enough for you to actually undertake to, 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 for you to be wanting uh, to do that green investment. Um, so now we're looking into different directions. We're looking at um, incorporating a lot of, uh, 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 what do call it? A lot of policies that related straight to the demand for the green goods itself. Uh, we're looking at how to model nudge in that economy. So now we're looking at the direction of creating a demand for, for green goods. That could also be um, kind of like generated by government policies, right? If, if you give subsidy to green products, let's say, or if you implement some policies that would change people's behavior towards the dirty uh, products, let's say, straws. <laughs> so I, I told you I live part-time in Bali now. I did beach cleanup last week. We went to Batu Balik Beach. Uh, within half an hour of you know, just walking down the beach with my latex glove and my bamboo <laughs> um, waist picker, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> I got a lot of like straws, I collected a lot, a lot, a lot of straws, which 
uh, waste straws, plastic straws, that, you know, we as a consumer, if you were um, really care about the environment, the, the first thing that you want to do is to just stop using plastic at all, right? And those small things that would make people understand that your behavior matters a lot if you, if you want to go into the an, an economy which um, which we call a green economy. So being environmentally friendly is not something that needs to happen from the production side, but I think it it, it will need to be happening from the uh, demand side as well. So now we're looking at putting different type of uh, policies that would accommodate that. How could we change people's behavior towards green production, towards green green products to increase the demand? And that would kind of like force the dirty producer, the, the, the uh, uh, polluting producer to switch into green investment without having to be kind of like incentivized by that 2%, 3% uh, you know, uh, difference, difference in their bank loans. So that's still a journey for us. So we have a lot of caveats in the model. As I said before, please don't quote, please don't cite. This is a work in progress and we are looking forward to hearing any comments, any inputs or uh, anything from anyone who's joining this forum. So I'll stop there. I don't have any more slides. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Masfaudi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Busikan. Uh, very interesting presentation, very interesting working paper. And I don't see anyone who wants to ask uh, his question yet. Okay, uh, please, Bulidia, uh, you raise your hand. Okay. While we are waiting for others to ask questions, I I think um, I have a couple of questions. Um, can you explain a little bit more uh, if, uh, if it's a part about the distinction between the green and the non-green firms? How do you make the distinction? Um, maybe another one, uh, even though the uh, from the monetary policy, there is no formal maybe policy, but what what are these policies where companies or um, I guess investment companies uh, uh, do when they create index of green firms or something like that in the capital market like for example in indonesia there is sri kahati which is the uh, uh, index of uh, public firms that fulfills the criteria of being environmentally sustainable biodiversity friendly um, made up by kahati and i know there are a lot of other uh, indexes such as this so that's that's for me thank you I think I should answer directly. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, Ibu, I think that's very interesting direction now because you also have ESG, right? That's Environmental Social and Governance Index or something like that. Basically, you can you can buy stocks that, you know, labeled as green. But uh, I try to invest <laughs> in those type of stocks. But it turns out they're pretty traditional FMCG companies. So they're not like Tesla or, you know, for example, uh, firms produce electric vehicle or solar panels or things like that. Those are still FMCG uh, uh, firms, but they have some environmental concern. So for example, if you, if, if you look at, um, so I'm, you know, I have a lot of interaction with people at Plastic Bank, SC Johnson, as you know it, they uh, create products with recycled material, so recycled plastic, things like that. So it's basically firms that has environmental awareness or uh, measure on environmental, but not necessarily, for example, carbon deficit firms. Probably they're carbon neutral or they they have some environmental concern, but not, but, but not uh, carbon um, deficit firms. 
Now, I think that's very interesting because we can put that into our model. So what we think of having is putting a some sort of green bonds into the model. So what if this firm, these firms, the green firms could, um, uh, they could you know, have, well, they, well, if you put it this way, they don't loan, they, they don't ask loan to the banks, but they, um, Chemical have bonds that the government would buy, right? So what does the government do? Ba they're basically just uh, uh, reallocating resources. So what I want is, you know, the, from the government to reallocate the sources into a more productive uh, measure uh, efforts, right? Now, what if that can be done? So what if the government could uh, point out, you know, if, if they can choose uh, green projects that they would give the fund to so the government basically just buy bonds from them rather than just giving them financing subsidy as i said before you know the difference of two percent or three percent it's it's not gonna matter <laughs> if you need like a a, a a huge sun cost for example or the investment to shift to the green um, uh, technology is so big you don't really care about the two percent uh, uh, subsidy by the government right but if you give them the money that would create a, a lot of a, a bigger difference. So that thought we think might work. So if we have a green bonds in the economy that is being, you know, uh, um, uh, kind of like uh, owned by the green firms and well, I don't want to call it QE, but it could be like a green QE as well. <laughs> so the government buy bonds from the green firms that would uh, kind of like channel the funds directly to the green firms. That's some kind of like a radical idea. It's it's going to be hard for us, for the government as well, to, to choose which one is the best. That's another top, you know, that's that's another topic for another day. But that's definitely, you know, a green bonds, you know, um, say, for example, green equity, green investment, things like that. We can put that into the model um, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the first question about the green firms, the, the, the firms green, and non-green, we uh, put the environmental concern into those two firms. So the dirty firms, when they produce, they emit pollution. And the more they produce, they, the more uh, uh, pollution that they're actually emitting. Uh, this comes from my experience. When I was a kid, I lived in, you know, uh, southern east part of Jogja. And my house, where I lived for 20 years, just behind my house, it's a, um, a a pan company, like aluminum company. They make pans, they make a uh, saucer, they make, you know. And um, it was pretty bad because our air is polluted, the water is polluted, the soil is polluted. And the more they produce, the more pollution that we felt, right? And that's how we model our company, the 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 the, the dirty uh, firm. So when they produce, they're going to emit pollution. The more they produce, the more pollution that they're going to emit, that they're going to produce, and that pollution would kind of like uh, stack up into the at atmospheric carbon or worsen climate uh, change. So that's what we do. The green firm is basically carbon neutral, so they're not carbon deficit, but they're carbon neutral. So when they produce, they don't pollute. So that's the difference between uh, the green and uh, dirty firms in the model. Uh, thank you for answering the question. So I see uh, Pak Arif Ramayandi uh, raise his hand. So please, pa Pak Arif, uh, you can ask your question by uh, using your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... This one will be this one will be difficult. This one will be like my uh, dissertation no, no, exam. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you very much for the nice presentation, Saka. It's a very interesting stuff. Um, I don't have much to say because I'm not an expert in green economy, but um, I might have a few comments from the modeling sides. Um, one of the comments is that the way you set up the model, if I understand correctly, I don't I don't know the full setup, but it seems like you are making in such a way, make it, making the model works in such a way that green production will be costly. Right? And hence, um, from the 
it, it, because you are using color coding for the greens, then I'll just use the black rather than dirty. Uh, so the black producers have to pay more cost if they have to, if they are producing, because um, if I understand correctly, the model introduces some abatement costs for their emission, uh, the emission uh, impact of their production. And then the green producers is also costly in a way because they require subsidy from the government. And that's, that's, that's built into the model. Um, uh, on, on, on that front, then basically any activities or any positive shocks into these two sectors, the black one in particular, will tend to increase inflation further, right? And that's what feed into your monetary policy reaction function and hence uh, decapacitating the, uh, the the desired effect of green production that we would like to have, perhaps. Um, I don't know if um, you can also modify the policy reaction function in such a way that you can um, separate out between the pure demand-driven uh, inflation, so uh, the core and the non-core, the cost push shock based uh, uh, that that was that was uh, come out as a result of the of, of the green promoting green production. If that can be done, then the 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 the, the reaction in the monetary policy side will not be as huge as what you currently have in the model, perhaps, and hence it could help you to. To, to, to get into the, your desired uh, conclusion, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, um, you, you know the model much better than me. That's, that's one, one, one probable suggestion that, uh, that could, 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 could be explored further. Um, the other thing is that, if I understand correctly, you're not just calibrating the parameters, but you also try to match it with data. Uh, and hence you are estimating the things. Uh, with this approach, I guess, if you are using historical data, the green production side is still going to be relatively very small in terms of size, right? And because of that, I don't think, I, I don't know, but because of that, my guess is that their coefficient is either become small or insignificant. And that's what I get, I think, is, driven, is driving the results, the insignificant results you see in the green production sites uh, relative to huge impact of a shock you see in the black production site. That's also something that, that, that you might want to look at. And on that point, on that note, I would suggest the paper also think, the paper also extended into thinking about um, doing a simulate, do, doing parameter-based simulation rather than just simulating the impact of shock using the same parameters. Because this is, uh, if I understand you correctly, the paper wants to have a forward-looking view of how to promote green production more. And hence, these parameters that, that, that are supposed to be the results of different policies uh, from, from, from the, the different government policies, can also be uh, altered in order to see how, or uh, in order to get what the government might do in order to promote this production. But, uh, I don't know if that helps, but maybe I'm completely wrong in whatever I said, but yeah, I, I'd like to hear your views on that. Thanks. Uh, all right, thank you. But I did that. Those are like valid, valid, valid uh, comments. So, um, the uh, when you look at monetary policy shocks and you know when you produce you create inflation and the monetary policy is kind of like reacting to the inflation uh, the reaction function becomes like the key to everything that we have in the model <laughs> right so we thought that estimating could at least and then we had the uh, short run interest data that would we think that we think could be having a um, um, really good result in the parameters of respond to the inflation, let's say respond to the output and the uh, inertia. 
Um, that's why we try to estimate that because we need to know what does that rea reaction function looks like. And when we look at the data, Pari, we actually didn't have the data for environment because um, I think we do have, I have to talk to my, uh, Santi again about this, but they don't, we don't have a quarterly data for uh, emission. Uh, so we had to interpolate it and it was not good. I mean, we, we didn't, like we weren't really satisfied with the result. So most of the environmental parameters, we calibrated it. Um, and when we calibrated it, we, uh, of course, then we have to look at, yes, I, I agree. Uh, we have to look at some uh, simulation based on that calibrated parameters, especially in, in, in on the uh, environmental side that we cannot estimate. And it's very, very, very sad because we do, we, we, we really do need the data. We just don't have it. <laughs> it, was, it was so frustrating. Um, and, and, I, and I agree with you when, when we talked about, you know, uh, trying to estimating the data and uh, the, the environmental side is, is you know, it's the key to everything. And then we don't have that data. We can go to the simulation route. Uh, thank you so much for the comments. I think we can do that in the future. We can uh, try to put like, you know, different parameters for, for example, in the abatement cost, in the uh, emission itself, how the emission build, builds up in the atmosphere and things like that. We can work on that such a way that um, we can have an insight of what if the, you know, uh, just a bit of pollution would have like big, impact on climate change, let's say, as opposed to, you know, if the, 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 the effect on climate change is very mild. So we can have a lot of um, parameters, simulation with parameters. Here, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, we need, we still need to find a lot of ways to make the paper richer. A lot of simulation, probably we also can do volatilities and stuff like that. So yeah, your comments are very, very valid. And we acknowledge some caveats, some uh, limitations that we got from estimating the model. And we can also only use like four or five data because we only have like five shocks in the model. So we don't have a lot of data to play around with. Um, whereas we have a lot of parameters that we wanted to estimate. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll definitely try to do that in our next iteration of the if, model. If I may add one more thing, Sakara. The thing that I really dislike of, out of your model is that whatever you do, if you are promoting green uh, production, you will tend to get lower consumption as a result and hence lowering welfare. That's something that you might want to think about as well. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Baru. Uh, thank you uh, to start for answering the question. So we can go to the next question from pa, uh, Krishna Gupta, because pa Krishna has raised his uh, hand. And please, pa Krishna, you can ask your question by using your microphone. Um, hello. Uh, thanks, Wadi. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Busika, that's a very interesting uh, presentation. A little bit building from Pak Arif, but first of all, a very, very basic question. Um, how how the carbon accumulation affects your model? Like um, how, for example, increase by uh, a unit of carbon reduces production by what unit or whatever, something like that. This could be the key to what Pak Arif said, right? Basically, if you if you introduce something green, consumption will drop. But if you don't introduce something green, consumption will drop in the future. And as as your consum consumers are rational, they are forward looking, um, and they should still eat something green, right? Because in the future, if carbon's too much, you get a lot of zero production, and then uh, world's going to end, stuff like that. Um, so, if you can a little bit share how the the carbon accumulation affects your whole um, uh, GDP um, um, and other other parts, maybe um, then will be great. Um, but secondly, I want to understand how the difference impact of your uh, the, one of your shock the racing rate um, how it differs between uh, the the green firms and the the, the not so green firms i.e both of them of course going to be smaller in production but which one gets uh, uh, even more smaller than the others um, 
probably if the green one is smaller or less, then it might be good if the, uh, uh, for this control, uh, central bank to uh, up their interest rate. Um, I think that's 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 for now. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Pa Krishna. So we saw a smaller contraction to the green firms, but we don't like contraction. At all. <laughs> so that's why we're trying to find a, a policy that might some in such a way that might not affect the green uh, production. But there's still a, a little contraction. If you compare to the, the dirty firms, the uh, effect of monetary policy is still bigger on the dirty firms rather than in the green uh, firms. Probably that's because of the subsidy as well. Uh, that could be the case. Now, if we um, look at the modeling, how the um, emission affects the production. So basically it goes through the total factor of productivity. Uh, think of it as like when you produce, you uh, when you produce the goods, you produce emission, the more emission that would worsen the climate change, you, the stock of atmospheric carbon would go up. That would reduce your total factor of productivity in a sense now that climate change introduces climate change related events. Say for example, you know, if you're an agricultural uh, firms, then you're very uh, um, dependent on the weather because of the climate change, the weather has gone, gone bad, you know, with the same amount of capital and the same amount of labor, you can only produce uh, a little, something like that. So there's a, um, again, you're correct, there's such a way that we created, we created a loop between uh, uh, production, emission, and the production, back to the production itself. Now the green production also affected by the climate change, right? So now their total factor of productivity is also affected by what the product, uh, well, what the dirty producer is also doing. When we look at household, the way that they choose the uh, whether to consume green or dirty products, they're doing it via the price ratio. So that's just the optimality condition, right? Marginal rate of substitution equals price ratio. So I think if we introduce some intervention on, on, on the price that the household pay for green products, probably that would create more demands for the green products. Um, and that would affect the green production more rather than, you know, going into the firm side and giving them um, subsidy. So that's the idea. They're not, well, the, on, on the consumer side, when they're forward looking, when they said, uh, when they see that, oh, there's more destruction in the future, um, that doesn't go directly to their optimization problem. That goes to the price ratio and, and you know how the climate change affect the prices of those two products, and that's how they decide which uh, products to buy. So basically, they they buy the product that's relatively cheap, which is very relevant to the problem that we're having right now. Because when you have two products, uh, the cheaper one is always going to be the one that has a you know, more established dirty technology versus if you look at like the green products, for example, you want to buy EV, electric vehicle, be it a car or a motorcycle, then you would definitely choose probably because out of familiarity, I would choose the, you know, say for example, motorcycle, I would just choose the, uh, the very famous brand that everyone is choosing. Uh, as opposed to if you look at like electric vehicle, you know, oh, it's so convenient and you have to charge it overnight. It can't go very far. It can't go very fast. You know, we're all not, we're all not Valentino Rossi, right? <laughs> but those kind of thing, but those kind of thing, uh, that's also the caveat of the model. We don't, we don't have a household that would prefer green products over non-green products, which I think that if we can somehow model uh, model a policy, uh, put a feature in, in the household optimization problem that would make the producer to, sorry, uh, consumer buy more green products. I think that will be uh, um, creating a lot more, you know, uh, big change, yeah, yeah, in uh, yeah. green production, yeah. Yeah, um, just, just one additional question, if, if I may. 
Um, so I, I, if I understand correctly, the, the bigger the carbon is, the smaller uh, the, the, the smaller uh, uh, technology, right? So with the same stuff, you produce less. Um, if the consumption doesn't change, i.e. there's no uh, consumer's uh, preference changing at all, then production will contract, right? Because um, carbon increases, production reduces, um, demand the same, then then price will go up, right? Um, and then central bank will intervene with in even more interest rate. But there will be a limit to that, right? At some point, consumption will keep decreasing because of the high price. Uh, am, am, I, am I understanding this correctly? Uh, this is what I meant by uh, the forward-looking consumers. Um, does that make sense to you? Uh, I'm sorry. If, if, if yeah, yeah. so um, the aggregate consumption is basically depending on the aggregate resources, right? Because this is representative agents and you know, uh, everyone has idiosyncratic risk, but their consumption is related to the aggregate consumption. So when you talk about a, a GDP that's contracting, um, consumption is also going to be contracting because, you know, you have a little resources that you should be divided into consumption investment and the government consumption, of course. Uh, so, yeah, we haven't really looked deeper into each type of uh, consumption, be it green and non-green, because we focus so much on green production, um, not in the consumption itself. Right. Yeah, but I think playing around with with with, with those and how put it, putting much more effort into um, modeling how our preference towards green product uh, green products versus non-green products, and what kind of policy that would um, affect that would be beneficial. I think. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to reading the full version, Sakar. Good luck with your uh, research. Thanks, thanks, thank you. So oh, thank you, Sakar, uh, for answering the question. So I don't see anyone who wants to ask the question yet. And I want, okay, so I see. Uh, okay, Parif Ramayadi. So I want to uh, read your question to Sakar in the Q and A box. So. The question from Parif is, how strong of a role do you put on the forward-looking element in your model? The intertemporal itself from the discussion just now sounds promising. Uh, Mr. you can uh, answer the question. Uh, yeah, Parif, so uh, the intertemporal problem for the household, it's basically still very rudimentary, a very basic DSG model. We haven't really thought of a uh, put into considerations of the you know preference between green and non-green, and and things like that. Uh, but this is something that we're looking at in the future for sure. Because as I said before, when we started this paper, we were so focused on subsidy because we thought that you know something has to change right if we want to incentivize people to to abandon dirty technologies dirty energy sources then how do we incentivize them but as we go along we realize that that might not be it like we can't just have like carbon tax or cap and trade and then hoping that the emission would go down that you know we would have a greener economy that's um yeah, it's it's something that it's it's far from our uh, ideal uh, world, really. So I'm gonna be looking at more into the intertemporal problems, especially for the household. We're we're, we're gonna be putting more into the behavior of a consumer, I think, rather than just focusing on the firm. Yeah, there's something that we're are working on as well. Thank you, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, okay, and Bolivia wants to ask uh, your question. Yeah, um, since there are no other questions, I'd like to take the the um, the time. So I remember that in the 80s, the government provided subsidies for conversion from um, appliances 
for firms uh, who are who were producing appliances, like for example, AC or uh, refrigerator using um, uh, chlorofluorocarbon CFCs. So if they don't want, if they want to convert and their public yeah, into not using CFCs, they get a grant and also some credit. And that also works. Um, people were actually, firms were actually taking advantage of that. But I think, um, one of the incentives that they take advantage of of it is because they know that uh, there will be a time coming very soon where uh, CFCs will be banned. So if they don't know that uh, this policy will be implemented soon, um, they might not take advantage of the carbon credits or the uh, uh, Oh, sorry, the, the cheaper credits or grants, well, grants they probably will take advantage of. Um, so this might be a consideration into building a timeline or a policy, for example, where in the future scenario, um, there is going to be a policy uh, that limits their, their ability to do production a certain way. So it's they don't know if it makes sense or not. Um, second, I wanted to ask, what is the uh, in your modeling? What level of credit subsidy did you the maximum credit subsidy that was uh, used? And also, um, I don't know if this is uh, possible or if if this is uh, has been done before. But what about implementing like a grace period kind of thing that they don't have to pay the loan until year five or something like that. Uh, I don't know if this is possible, but if, if it's a sovereign loan, for example, Indonesia is borrowing from multilateral agencies, we don't really have to pay until, I don't know, year 10 or something like that sometimes. So if this can be built um, into the model and see what the firm responses would be. Thank you. Yeah, so Bolivia, I think uh, banning the dirty technology is the most efficient way to go into green <laughs> green economy. Uh, unfortunately, there are what we call transition risk, where if you ban all of the dirty technologies, means that there will be abandoned machines, abandoned engines, abandoned plants. Uh, and those are like assets for the firms itself when they want to, for example, um, uh, get the loan from the banks, right? So we can't just abandon dirty technology. If we want to phase out fossil fuel uh, consumption, let's say, I think the best way to go around it is to stop... Um, uh, what should I call it? <laughs> uh, stop having an artificial price on fossil fuel. So liberalize fossil fuel price. That would, you know, if, if the fossil fuel in the world is getting like, more expensive, then the, the, fir the firms has to pay more of that, right? Now that it's like $100 per barrel, then it's going to be very expensive for them. If the price of energy is keep getting up, especially fossil fuel, then people would think of like, oh, how do I shift to another type of energy? For example, we paid a lot for our electricity. Uh, we have two ACs, so we're not really environmentally friendly anyway. <laughs> so we, but what we think that, oh, if we have a solar panel, at least now we can also create energy that we can also send into the PL PLN grid. So we ended up now have, having to pay only a third of our electricity bill because we're using the solar panels. So, but that's that's very costly because if you think of a plant that has you know everything, dirty technology, fossil fuel, and things like that, if you want to change that into something that's greener, then it would take time. And I think I agree with you. If, if we, we want to have that, then we have to transition into green technology, green economy, not within like five years, probably takes more than that. But as long as you have like the right government policy to to, to gear towards that um, development, then I think that will be great. Um, the carbon tax is the first 
policy that is <laughs> environmentally friendly policies that are being implemented by the government. We're not sure how is that going to pan out. Uh, a lot of people are skeptical about it, but at least that's like the first step towards that. I think when you talk about like subsidizing, uh, for example, green technology, you know, so people can ditch the the, the CFC technology and do something greener. That also something that we uh, that we can do. Um, yeah, so that's I think that's that's the answer for the first uh, question. Do, do you have any follow up question? Is that <laughs> no? Um, uh, oh, so you want to uh, continue your answer? Yeah, no, go so, ahead. Go. Yeah. <laughs> because, um, uh, I have. Oh, we still have one question from the Q and A. Oh, okay. Krishna Gupta. Okay, so I think I uh, I'm gonna also uh, answer Buli the questions about okay, the okay, okay. the subsidy. So we do zero percent, five zero percent, five percent, fifteen percent to twenty percent of the uh, credit, the the interest rate. So we do that to to see that whether if we change the the amount of the subsidy that we give, um, that would change a lot. But it, yeah. Um, so we do simulation for that because we don't have the data in the past ebook. We just, you know, just play around with the model. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Busaka. So uh, we still have one question from Pakistan Gupta. So I want to read the question to you. So if there is something such as like optimal emission accumulation of Indonesia, like would it be possible to be shown by the model? Um, optimal emission accumulation. Wow, that's I don't know. This uh, does it have to be something like with metric tons or something like that? But <laughs> because I don't think the model could uh, generate something like that. So this is not quite like CGE model. Uh, the the model doesn't spit out numbers, but it spits out transmission mechanisms. So it's gonna be hard for us to generate that number of optimal emission uh, accumulation. And this is just not the right model to uh, answer that kind of question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Busika. So since anyone doesn't want to uh, ask the question, I want to ask the question because I, I'm really curious on this. So uh, because in typical DIC model, in the typical DIC paper, in intermediate good sector and in the final good sector, we don't see like classification from the firms, right? So like just one firm, uh, is it like they, they, they are categorized as the final good sector or the intermediate good sector? So how do you incorporate the, the classification of the uh, green firm and non-green firm in both of the uh, intermediate good sector and the final good sector? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, so it's a good question, Fawdi. Uh This is more technical techni technicalities that, that, that um, I think uh, when you reading into the literature, uh, because you want to have nominal rigidity, you want to have a, an efficiency in the model, then you create that price rigidity. Uh, but both we introduce in the green sector and uh, the non-green sector, uh, they have different characteristics, but the final good firms are basically just a packer. So if you think of a, uh, a supermarket, like if you think of Indonesia as Matahari. Where did you go, Matahari? Oh, it's so hot. <laughs> no, <it's>, <laughs> um, uh, but if you look at Matahari, they, they have a lot of like goods, right? Uh, they, the, basically they, uh, the, the inputs are intermediate goods. You know, they sell it in their uh, shop, but they're basically just like packing. So it's, it's the, the final good firm is just, just a good packers. So they buy each of the green firms, uh, intermediate green firms, the products from the dirty green firms, and then they just you know pack it all up together and sell it as a final goods. So that's that's a problem to, to get around that you know, we need a price rigidity, um, but we put it price rigidity in the intermediate goods firm, final goods firm are perfectly competitive. So yeah, that's very standard, but the distinct distinction between green and non-green firm is very um, important. Yeah. Thank you, Saka. And since I don't see anyone wants the question, I still have like one question 
So uh, I, I see your findings. So based on the first policy simulation and the second policy simulation, so uh, based on those policy simulation, uh, in the condo degree marks, it is written that the government spending shocks will uh, will like reduce the production from both of the green firm and the non-green firm, and the yeah, and then we have like the uh, policies such as like uh, emission tax and subsidies. So, can we conclude? Is it better uh, like the effect of the policy from the first policy simulation or the second policy simulation? Thank you, Chenari. Okay, so um, in, 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 in doing our simulation, we keep the level of production to be constant in steady state for each type of, uh, for, each, for each simulation that we do, right? So basically when you look at like how far it is from the steady state, from that zero line, that's how deep the contraction is. And that's a percentage from the steady state. It's not like, you know, numbers. When you look at how that simulation of policy, for example, car carbon tax, and then you have the financing subsidy, when you look at the uh, change relative to the steady state, those don't change so much. Um, and because you know all of the uh, output, we uh, kind of like fix the fix the output to be one in the steady state. That shows how big. Um, if you compare, then it's those are like comparable numbers. Um, the left hand side and the right hand side. The left hand side is the carbon tax. The right hand side is the financing subsidy. You see that the the band on that left hand side is bigger uh, rather than on the right hand side. So when you want to create such a big impact of green subsidy, then you have to subsidize the credit for very big amount. <laughs> I tried like 75% or like 80%. That's That would create a, a, a bigger impact, but that just doesn't make sense, right? It means that if you um, yeah, take a loan from the bank, instead of paying 10%, you're only paying 2%. Uh, I don't think that is visible for any bank in Indonesia that would give me like 2% of loan. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not happening. Uh, well, of course, if the government forced them to give that kind of loan, yeah, for sure. But if you look at into the market mechanism, I don't think that's something um, that, that, that makes sense. So if you look at those two, carbon tax does have a, uh, a bigger room to be implemented if you want to look at like uh, uh, creating a bigger impact on green production. Just just for the fact that, you know, the green financing subsidy has a very, very uh, a small margin or, you know, small space that you could exploit versus if it's like a carbon tax. Okay, thank you, Scott. So, uh, I think uh, we want to end our webinar today. So, thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Very uh, interesting topic. And... Thank you for asking your question to Mr. Kar. And I want to thank you as well to the uh, Forum Kajian Pembangunan for hosting this webinar. So go back to you, Buludia. Uh, 